In this video, I'm going to talk about graph convolutional networks and how they're an extension to traditional neural networks that take full advantage of graph structure. When I first got into this topic, I found some of the papers and diagrams a little confusing, but it's actually pretty simple. So if you stick around to the end, I'm confident you'll be able to understand how GCNs work without having to spend the hours reading the literature. So first I'll talk about how GCNs work in general, and then I'll present a content abuse example to really work through it step by step. So if you like this type of content, or you'd like to hear about the live stream journal clubs we do, please subscribe at my website or join us on Discord. Uh, and a link to both of those will be in the description below. The idea of message passing in a graph is a really powerful concept because a lot of the graph algorithms can be understood from that perspective. In a nutshell, the idea is that a node in a graph can send and receive messages along its connections with its neighbors. This can be thought of as happening in two steps. First, nodes will send out a message about itself to its neighbors. And next, nodes collect the neighbor messages they receive and use them in some way to update itself and understand its environment. In a fraud use case, you might see how known fraud labels can propagate through the graph by continually passing and collecting messages. This is the essence of the label propagation algorithm. Here's a little schematic showing how this works conceptually in a graph that connects accounts with their shared attributes like IP address and credit card numbers. In label propagation, each node in the graph starts with an initial state, and that state is updated by receiving messages from the other nodes that it's connected to. And this repeats in the next iteration, except each node now starts with its updated state, which takes its neighbors into consideration. Think of this as smoothing the label information across a neighborhood. For a deep dive on how this works, check out the first video in the series, which is linked in the description below. GCNs can be understood as a simple message passing algorithm. But whereas label propagation just passes messages about the label value, GCNs do this for an entire vector of input data. So an account doesn't just tell its neighbors, I'm known fraud or not, but my credit card is from the US and my IP address is from Vietnam and my billing address is in Ireland and whatever else you know about the account. If label propagation is label smoothing in a neighborhood, think of GCN as feature smoothing. Let's make this concrete by talking through a simple calculation in a GCN layer. For any node in the graph, first get all of the attribute vectors of its connected nodes and apply some aggregation function, like an average. Not only does aggregation make sure that the representation is the same size, regardless of the number of neighbors, but it makes some intuitive sense that a node might be represented by the average of its neighbors. Next, pass this average vector through a dense neural network layer which is a fancy way of saying multiply it by some matrix and apply an activation function. The output of this dense layer is the new vector representation of the node. So now a node isn't just an average of its neighbors, but the average of its neighbors pass through some nonlinear function. When talking about how a single GCN layer works throughout this video, I'll keep coming back to this refrain. First, aggregate the neighbors, then pass that to a standard neural net. If you can keep this clear, GCNs will be a lot easier to understand. Let's go to the next step in complexity and say you have a two-layer GCN. First, let me point out that we have so far focused on how a single node is updated. But this process must be done for every node in the graph. Each node collects messages from its neighbors, aggregates those messages, and passes the resulting vector through a standard neural net to get a new vector that represents the node. The node is then represented by this new vector. For a second layer, all you do is repeat the same process, except the input is the updated vectors from the first layer. This is similar in concept to a traditional fully connected neural network. The raw input goes into the first layer, and the output of the first layer is the input of the second layer, and so on. The same is true with GCNs, except there's a pre-processing step at the beginning of each layer, where a node has to first get the values of all its neighbors and aggregate them. Okay, so you can aggregate neighbors and pass them through a dense neural network layer. So what? Well, this opens up some interesting learning opportunities. Consider that the size of the node vectors coming out of the GCN layer is determined by the number of units in your neural network layer, or in other words, the number of columns in your weight matrix, 
If we want to classify each node, like fraud or not fraud, we can set this output dimensionality to 1 and use a typical binary cross entropy loss function with backpropagation to train all of our parameters. Let's talk through a simple content of use example using a single layer GCN. Let's say we have a graph where each node is a tweet and then two tweets are connected if they were posted using either the same IP address or the same account. And further, let's say we want to use the actual content of the tweet as a node attribute. So maybe we hash each of the words and count them up, or we do something fancier like using pre-trained word embeddings. But regardless of technique, let's say we end up with a 10-dimensional vector representing the content of each tweet. If you just wanted to classify each piece of content individually, you could just pass these vectors into a logistic regression model, or whatever classifier you wanted to use. But this would not take advantage of the IP or account ID information. Alternatively, you could use label propagation on the graph structure, but this wouldn't take advantage of the content of the tweet. The GCN uses both and works as follows. For a given node, first aggregate its content vectors with all of those that were posted using the same IP address or account ID. That aggregation function might be sum or average, and here let's just use average. For a single layer GCN model, this neighborhood average vector is multiplied by a 10 by 1 weight matrix and then passed through an activation function to result in a single number for each node that corresponds to the probability of that tweet being abusive content. This is effectively the same as using the neighborhood averaging as a pre-processing step, where the output is then used as input to a logistic regression model. First, aggregate the neighbors, then pass to a standard neural net. Now, let's consider a two-layer GCN. For the first step, we still average all the neighborhood content vectors. But this time, instead of multiplying this by a 10 by 1 weight matrix to output a single fraud prediction number from the first layer, Let's instead use a 10 by 5 weight matrix so that we output a 5-dimensional vector. Now, every node in the graph is not represented by the original 10-dimensional content vectors, but instead by a 5-dimensional vector that's output from the first GCN layer. This is the input to our second GCN layer. Here, we once again gather all the neighbor's vectors and average them together for every node. This results in a single neighborhood aggregated 5-dimensional vector for each node, which we can then multiply by a 5 by 1 weight matrix to get our final fraud predictions from the second layer. So with two GCN layers, each node has pulled their neighbor's vectors two times, one for each layer. In both cases, they aggregate the vectors they get and pass the result into a dense neural network layer. The important part is that for a node binary classification task, the last layer should have an output dimension of 1, and the internal hidden layers can be whatever size that you want. This is no different than any other neural network being used for binary classification. You just have these additional computation steps of aggregation based on the graph neighborhoods in between the layers. It's also worth emphasizing that the number of GCN layers puts an upper limit on how far a signal can travel. For instance, with a two-layer GCN, the message passing operation happens twice. This means the signal coming from any particular message can travel a maximum of two hops away from the source node. If long-range connections are important to your problem, you'll need more GCN layers. But the story doesn't stop here. GCNs are really just starting to scratch the surface. For instance, what if your graph has connections of different types? Maybe some accounts are connected because they share an IP address. Maybe others are connected because they share a credit card number. Do we just average all of the neighbors together regardless of the connection type? What if some connections are more important than others? Well, this is where relational GCNs come in, and that'll be the topic of our next video. So, see you then.